So you guys have seemed to enjoy my deep dive into various weird sub-communities within the alt-right. So I was thinking about what I could do for my next video on this weird niche topic and I thought I found a good one and today we're going to be talking about why the alt-right are seemingly so obsessed with Japan and Asian people and Asian cultures in general and how they still adore and accept these, I guess, nations and groups that are contradictory to, I guess, general fascist beliefs that you've got to have, I guess, one race in a country and create this ethno state, but seemingly even some of the leaders of the alt-right have a real, I guess, blind spot or exception for Asian people. Now, to start this video off, I will start with two quotes. So the first one is, I have never regarded the Chinese or the Japanese as being inferior to ourselves. They belong to an ancient civilization, and I admit freely that their past history is superior to our own. Adolf Hitler, 1945. I have great respect for the East Asian races. Even if we were to go extinct, they could carry something on. They are by nature very racist and great allies of the white race. I am not opposed at all to allies with the North East Asian races. Dylan Roof. So the point of reading those two quotes is to show you that there is a pretty clear through line in white supremacy from the days of Adolf Hitler to the days of the modern memeing or right. It is an exception that has been prevalent in fascist rhetoric from white countries for a while. So in this video, what we're going to do is talk about why white supremacists and white nationalists make exceptions for Asian cultures. And then we're going to focus specifically on Japan and talk about why these groups really do idealise modern Japan as a nation to, I guess, aspire to and a nation that shows the success of an ethno state. But before we go any further, please like the video and maybe subscribe to the channel to support me. It really helps me out. Check out my social medias and Patreon in the description. So there was a good New York Times article in 2018 titled The Alt-Right's Asian Fetish by Audrey Lim that really highlights a lot of the issues we're going to talk about, especially in regards to how the alt-right often view Asian culture. So let's start with this. And we'll start with the racist myths. So first is the idea of the model minority in which Asian Americans are painted as all hardworking, high achieving and sufficiently well behaved to assimilate. If Asians are the model minority, if that is how non-whites can find acceptance in white America, then perhaps that opens the door to acceptance from white supremacists. The second myth is that of the subservient, hypersexual Asian woman. The white supremacist fetish combines those ideas and highlights a tension within the project of white supremacism as America grows more diverse. A reality that white nationalists condemn as white genocide the new ugly truth, maintaining white power may require some compromises on white purity. So what she's referring to is obviously some racist stereotypes you hear that, you know, all Asian people are, you know, geniuses at maths, they're all hardworking, they are all, I guess, subservient, they're all respectful, they will not act out, they will do whatever it takes to assimilate to white countries. Now, the roots of this myth gaining prevalence as a good thing, especially in countries like America, really has its roots in the Cold War. Now, of course, I don't need to tell you that America has an awful history with the Asian world in treating Asian peoples abroad and at home really badly, of course. You know, a famous example, which we talk about a lot these days, is the Japanese internment in America, where, of course, during World War II, they sent, I think, about 200,000 Japanese people living in America, including Japanese Americans, to internment camps because they believed that during the war that these guys would act as spies for the Japanese or potentially participate in some sort of uprising once the Japanese landed in America. And of course before that there was laws against Asian immigration all that stuff. So it really is not a good history for Asians in America. But Asians did become more established and what happened in the Cold War of course was America started fighting wars against communism in Asia. So of course you had the Korean War, you also had the Vietnam War, and you had these communities back in America supporting American efforts, but Americans also held up Asians as this group of people who could be you know, trusted to fight communism. They had America's back and they were people who were pretty compatible with Western values. And you see that when you know the Americans obviously took over Japan after the end of the Second World War and imposed an American 
Western style of government on them. So it really became, you know, in, in American consciousness that Asians were people that could easily get along with Americans. And it was in the American government's best interest to promote these stereotypes about Asian people. Of course, they did propaganda campaigns about, you know, various Asian leaders. ZM is a big one, so have a look at these covers of him on various magazines and, you know, look how great he looks, he's wearing a Western suit. And ask yourselves, would America ever do this with African countries fighting communism, black African countries, of course, you know that's not the case. They in fact did the reverse, where they propped up white governments in Africa to target black people. But that also links into an interesting point about the propaganda. While they were raising Asians up and promoting Asian causes in their fights against communism, basically what they were doing was saying to black communities, well, you know, Asians came over to this country, they have done okay, you know, they've raised themselves up, of course, ignoring the, you know, systemic racism in America that targets black people specifically to keep them oppressed, of course, ignores the history that most black people in America are descendants of people who were brought over in chains as slaves. It's a completely different footing from Asian people who came over to America as migrants most of the time to look for work and opportunity. Now speaking of post-war Asia and Cold War Asia, this is also where the stereotype about Asian women really gained prominence. Of course you had thousands and thousands of US servicemen stationed in China just after the war, stationed in Korea and stationed in Japan and of course what happened in these devastated economies was there was a lot more prostitution and brothels and American servicemen obviously used these a lot, a lot of them you know, had kids and everything with these prostitutes and with Asian women in general. So it gave rise to the stereotype that Asian women are there to service the troops, they're there to service the white man and they are subservient to your needs. Of course, take that to Vietnam and you had lots of American troops engaging with these Vietnamese prostitutes, again, giving more rise to this stereotype about Asian women. Asian women were meek, they were there just to pleasure the white man, essentially, and of course, a lot of people didn't think of that in those terms, but when your cultural experience of women from Asia is really relegated to sex, and paid sex at that, where they will do what you want because you're paying them, then of course this stereotype really gains prominence, but it is a historic stereotype, that has its roots, I guess, in the colonial period in general, especially when you read stuff about the Orient from back in the day in places like Britain. So how do these stereotypes fit in with an alt-right worldview? So in the alt-right's opinion, you know, Asians are centered around the family, they're hardworking, they don't kick up a fuss, they are prosperous capitalists as well because they've done so well through, you know, the American dream and everything like that. And in terms of, you know, women as well, Women are subservient, they're obedient, and that really solves a problem the alt-right have with Western women because of feminism and movements for women's liberation, whereas in their opinion, Asian women do not have that, so they fit into the nice nuclear family that fascists often construct. You know, you see the role women had in Nazi Germany, that is a good example of what fascists want women to be. You know, you're the mother, you're, you're the caretaker of the home. In their mind, Asian women from these stereotypes are a perfect candidate for that, whereas a lot of Western women are brainwashed by communism, by feminism, and they no longer want to be part of the family unit, and essentially they are part of the destruction of Western culture. And I will just make the point before we get into the Japanese stuff, I don't think these stereotypes are obviously relegated to the alt-right, and I actually think a lot of American liberals and Western liberals have these perceptions of Asian people and they do feel it's beneficial to the liberal world order, to the capitalist world order, for Asians to exist in these stereotypes because it does benefit the Western hegemony of the world, which is, of course is increasingly being challenged by Asian countries like China. But let's focus our attention on Japan specifically. What is it about Japan that the alt-right love combined with these Asian stereotypes? So, of course, in modern history, Japan was, of course, an ally of Nazi Germany. Not so much that they fought together, but, you know, with Mussolini and Nazi Germany, the Japanese signed a pact, basically saying, you know, we have common interests. And, of course, during this time, Japan was a fascist military dictatorship. And I mentioned the Sino-Japanese War in World War II, and a lot of Nazis and fascists have this image in their head of the warrior culture of Japan, of course, Samurai and you know Samurai Code and all this stuff is pretty much world famous thanks to 
movies and media and it is pretty fascinating the these specific warriors but of course what happened in world war ii you had a lot of this culture from the militarism of the time seep into the armed forces who were totally fanatical to their cause they're totally brutal they were insane fighters in, in essence they were like you know really fanatical jihadists from today because they would do suicide bombings they would do suicide banzai charges they would drive their planes into american ships all that type of stuff but to the alt-right, that is something positive in terms of it shows these people are super militaristic and ready to die and conquer for their ethno state. Of course, this stereotype is quite at odds with modern Japan. And of course, it's quite at odds with historic Japan because this period of fascism in Japanese history is not indicative of the wider and, you know, very, very long history of Japan. But in terms of modern Japan, Japan is a prosperous country. Japan has, a, you know, a great economy. Japan, of course, is very, very friendly with the US and it relies on the US for a lot of its security from countries like North Korea and China because of the treaty signed after the war where it dissolved its military in favor of a self-defense force. And it even renounced war thanks to Kazuhiro Miller from Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker for teaching me all about that. Free us like a damn fiddle! But it's also ethnically pretty homogenous. I think it's nearly like 98% Japanese or something, which is pretty unheard of in a country that is so closely tied to the West. So they see all this prosperity in Japan and the success it has had after the war. They say, you know, this country did it and it stayed, you know, ethnically homogenous, unlike all these European countries and America, which has become totally diverse. And in their view, you know, diversity is ruining Western culture and ruining Western prosperity. But another part of Japan's relatively closed borders. So in the refugee crisis that started three years ago, Japan has not been keen on taking in any refugees. Japan is one of the countries with the lowest number of accepted refugees. According to an article in the Financial Times, Japan took only 28 refugees in 2016. Because of the strict refugee policy, members of the alt-right expressed their appreciation for the Japanese immigration policy. Alt-right personality Jared Taylor stated in an article that the Japanese should be praised for protecting itself from alien cultures that won't adapt to the Japanese way of living. Some even made extreme claims that the country is trying to preserve its purity in the form of ethnocentrism. Also linked to this is another thing they cite. So another aspect that the alt-right members mention about Japan is its low crime rate. So crime in Japan is dropping amid the longest economic expansion in almost three decades, making it one of the safest nations ever. The alt-right believes this is because of the lack of diversity in Japanese society. It's well known the alt-right is always against diversity, claiming multiculturalism has failed. For them, Japan is a country that isn't very multicultural and is seen as an argument against diversity so it's clear the conclusion that alt-right make is that japan and their prosperity has come from them having you know a relatively homogenous ethnic makeup a culture that doesn't let in many refugees a culture that i guess stays true and pure to their past and it's you know no other factors which you can clearly see whether that is the US essentially pumping loads of money designing you know Japan's economic system and constitution after the war more so than other countries because it was such a vital base during the cold war because of geopolitical reasons it's you know proximity to russia and china and of course north korea so japan would not be where it is today without the us boosting its economy and then boosting its products i'm not saying it hasn't done a lot of work on its own but i don't understand how you would draw the conclusion that you know its ethnic makeup plays a massive role in any of this and of course it's you know history led to its you near know, total destruction in World War II. This extreme ethno-centered fascism Japan subscribed to for over 10 years essentially destroyed the country. And as right-wing as the Japanese government are, as right-wing as many of its governments have been, and they haven't apologized for war crimes in World War II, of course they visit that shrine every year which celebrates some of these people, haven't, you know, in many people's opinion, significantly apologized for the comfort women in China and Korea. It's not a fascist country, even though you can see it's pretty hardline against refugees. But to sum all this up, the alt-right essentially make an exception for Asian people because they have, I guess, a very, very storied and historic past, especially countries like China. In their view, from the stereotypes promoted in America, they are hard working, they are subservient, they're not going to kick up a fuss, they are compatible with Western values and Western capitalism, and they are potential allies in the fight against things like communism, as they have proven, 
With Japan specifically, they have an extremely militaristic past, especially in the last 100 years. They have already tried out fascism, and many fascists will see you know, that as their glory days where they conquered a lot of Asia. And then you also have Japan today, which is very culturally homogenous and in their mind is key to their massive success on the world stage. And then of course in their sexist view from stereotypes around Asian women in general and of course because of the experience of Western men with Asian women after the Second World War in countries like Japan, Korea and China for alt-right see Asian women as the perfect tool I guess to keep the family unit intact because these women are subservient they will always defer to the man and it's a good way to keep the nuclear sort of family in check and keep a woman and man's role separate. Unlike these crazy Western feminists who do not want to do that anymore and are really paving the way for the destruction of the West alongside, you know, the communists and, you know, the cultural Marxists and all this stuff. So anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Please like the video, maybe subscribe to the channel. If you want to follow me on social media, check out my Twitter and Instagram at The Cavernacle. Also, please come and join my subreddit, r slash The Cavernacle. Check out my personal Reddit and maybe message me if you want to talk. That is you slash Tommy Cahill 1995. If you want to check out my Patreon, that is in the description. Also check out my WordPress and Medium. Please also listen to my podcast with my girlfriend where we talk about how much we hate capitalism and modern office jobs. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.